Oh, hey, hi there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I'm Liv, that woman who yells. Well, I'm doing as I promised. While the official month of Pride is over, being proud of who you are really does run all year round. So today's episode caps off the brief series of LGBTQ episodes that I covered in June. As I've mentioned, the trick I'm encountering now is that many stories of LGBTQ characters of Greek mythology are just references, small notes of relationships or characters, rather than full stories. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to tell them, just means you get an episode full of them. So yes, today's episode is going to cover a number of these stories, as many as I can fit. And so, I give you... Mini-Myth. Olympians put the B in LGBTQ+, a pride compendium. First up today is a relationship had by the god of wine and orgies himself, our friend Dionysus. Okay, fine, he's not the official god of orgies, but I mean, he's the god of orgies. Here, though, I'll call him Bacchus by his Roman name, as this version of the story comes from my beloved Ovid. But not his famous metamorphoses. No, it's just a brief mention in his work called Fasti, a poetical calendar. A satyr named Ampelos lived on the Ismarian hills. He's the son of a satyr and a nymph, though he resembles his satyr father most, and is, quite ruggedly, described as unshorn. Bacchus falls in love with Ampelos. Bacchus, I would argue, is quite proudly pansexual. His love knows no bounds. Bacchus falls in love with Ampelos, and so he entrusts him with a particular grapevine, for, of course, Bacchus is god of wine. This vine that Bacchus entrusts with Ampelos is hanging from a leafy elm tree, and on this day, Ampelos has climbed high into the tree in order to pick the grapes from the vine. Tragically, he loses his footing in the tree and he falls to his death. So he's placed in the sky as the constellation best known as Buotes, and vines are forever named after him. The ancient Greek word for vine is simply ampelos. Once again, from one of my most beloved friends, Ovid, comes a story of Hermes, Mercury, as the Romans called him, and Venus, or Aphrodite. Though you'll quickly learn that everything would have made a hint more sense if Ovid had used the Greek names for these gods rather than the Roman. The caves on Mount Ida are well known. So many things happened on Mount Ida in mythology that one might have to believe there were in fact two mountains, which is my very awkward way of explaining that in classical mythology there were two Mount Idas, one on the island of Crete and one in the general area of Troy, though really just Anatolia in Turkey. I also learned, while clarifying Idas, that there's one in Salmon Arm, British Columbia, which is interesting, while simultaneously being boring, because, I'm sorry, nothing exciting happens in Salmon Arm. It's called Salmon Arm, like the fish, but with an arm. Anyway, this story from my beloved Ovid takes place in the Phrygian Ida, the one in Turkey. In the caves on this Mount Ida, the child of Venus and Mercury is born. Ovid refers to Venus, Aphrodite, here as the Cytherian goddess, which might be his way of not ruining the meaning of the child's name by calling Aphrodite by her Roman name of Venus. Because yes, the child of Mercury and Venus is named Hermaphroditus, a combination of Hermes and Aphrodite, because the origin of the character is indeed Greek. Though it's our friend Ovid who tells their story in the most beautiful and crazy of ways. In some versions, Hermaphroditus is born intersex, with both sex organs, giving us the word hermaphrodite. But in others, like this one, he's born male. He's just the cutest baby, taking equally the looks of his parents, quite the looker. Raised by nymphs, naiads, because of course his parents were too busy, the gods rarely do the raising of their children. They've got far too many humans to have sex with, and wars to cause, you know. When he was a teenager, Hermaphroditus decided to go out on his own to explore beyond the mountain where he'd been raised. He wanders and eventually comes upon a pool, 
Its waters are so crystal clear, you can see the bottom. There's no plants, no icky lake things that tickle your feet and make you feel like there just has to be the most terrifying monster looking in the depths. No, it was pristine, like the souk potholes, which is a reference to maybe two people. Please let me know if one of these people is you. Beyond the pool, there were meadows, the most beautiful green meadows, the flowers, and gosh, just everything you can imagine that make up a beautiful meadow. I don't know. This pool, surrounded by this beautiful meadow, is home to a nymph. But she's no ordinary nymph. She doesn't like hunting or archery or even running. A woman after my own heart, honestly. This nymph is the only one of her sisters not to want to join Diana, Artemis. You all know how Diana loved her nymphs. And this nymph's name is Selmachus. And when Selmachus sets eyes on Hermaphroditus, oh man, she was in, like, truly madly deeply into this random stranger she'd just come upon because, holy goddamn, is he hot. Ovid says it best when he describes her first speaking to him. She compliments everything she can think of. Oh man, are you a god because you look like it? If no, your parents are blessed as hell. If you've got a brother, he must feel lucky. Or a sister, man, she must feel fortunate. But luckiest of all must be the woman you're going to marry. And say, is there one? Because if not, let me just put my name in the running right here and now. If you don't have a bride chosen yet, please, for the love of God, choose me, she says. And if you think I'm making things up right now, other than a bit of colloquializing on my part, as I want to do, then you've got another thing coming. This is her speech, though perhaps the original is a bit more ovity. And honestly, even more like that. <sighs> Hermaphroditus is a bit taken aback. Not because he isn't flattered, but because he just has no idea what's going on. He's been totally ignorant of love and attraction and really any of what Salmachus has just said to him. I mean, he lived on a mountain with a bunch of nymphs who raised him until about five minutes ago. He needs some time to get used to the real world, where nymphs are super forward and just a bit thirsty. Salmachus, though, is persistent. She just keeps trying to convince Hermaphroditus that he should be into her, and then she straight up tries forcing him to kiss her. It's not good, and one of the few, if not only, stories where the woman is being the absolute creep and bordering on rapey. Finally, Hermaphroditus is so over trying to keep pushing her off of him that he tells her if she doesn't stop, he's just going to leave her alone in her pool. Salmachus finally listens to Hermaphroditus' protests, and she tells him that if he really doesn't want her, she'll leave him alone, and he can enjoy the pool all to himself. <sighs> and then she straight up pretends to leave, but she doesn't, and she just hides behind a bush to watch him. Fucking creep. Hermaphroditus believes he's alone, and he decides to take a bath in the pool. He strips down and jumps in, and this only makes Salmachus crazier, more obsessed with well, straight up raping him. She jumps in after him, herself now naked, and grabs hold of Hermaphroditus even as he protests. She grabs him and she kisses him and touches him, grabbing hold with all her might, completely against his will. Ovid describes her hold on him as a snake's coiling tail, ivy around tree trunks, octopus that hold on to its prey beneath the sea. Not the nicest descriptors, but then Ovid tends to be brutally honest about what he's describing. In this case, Salmachus assaulting Hermaphroditus. Salmachus tells Hermaphroditus that no matter how hard he may try, he won't be able to get out of her grasp. And then she calls up to the gods, asking for them to be merged together, becoming one being, never again to be apart. Which would be kind of romantic if Hermaphroditus had wanted any part of it, instead it's gross and awful. And this at least in Ovid's telling, is how Hermaphroditus becomes intersex, both male and female. It also tells that this pool where the transformation occurs on the request of Hermaphroditus to his godly parents now serves to transform anyone who swims in it. Any man who swims in this pool now, this fountain of Salmachus, becomes more feminine. <laughs> Back again to our friend Dionysus, though this time I'll call him just that. When we meet Dionysus here, he's needing to travel to the underworld, but he doesn't know the way. 
he comes upon a man named Prosimnos, who promises to tell him his way into Hades, provided he fulfills one request Prosimnos has. Prosimnos, you see, wants desperately to have sex with Dionysus. Dionysus is all about sex, so he doesn't hesitate to agree to this request. He'd be happy to, he says to Prosimnos, though I'm definitely paraphrasing. Dionysus is, after all, the god of bacchanals, known for their orgies and the like. He isn't one to shy away from that type of ask. And so Prosimnos tells Dionysus how to reach his destination in the underworld, giving him all the instructions and directions he needs to fulfill whatever it is he needs to do there. We're not told what. But when Dionysus returns from the underworld to seek out Prosimnos to fulfill the promise he happily made with the man, he is unable to find him, as Prosimnos had died in the time it took Dionysus to travel to the underworld and back. But Dionysus doesn't want to let that keep him from fulfilling his promise. Necrophilia? You might ask out loud, hesitantly, as I tell you Dionysus plans to fulfill the request, even though Prosimnos is dead. But don't be disgusting. No, Dionysus has a far cleverer way of doing this. He travels to Prosimnos' tomb, and he brings with him a branch from a nearby fig tree. Dionysus carefully shapes this branch into the shape of a phallus, and a nice one at that. And with his fig tree phallus, Dionysus fulfills the promise he made to Prosimnos. How incredibly romantic, wouldn't you say? Because of this act by Dionysus, because he fulfilled his promise in this incredibly creative and Dionysian way, thus begins the practice of phalloi. These are memorials to this event, set up in cities dedicated to Dionysus. And, if I'm not mistaken, they are. Quite simply, large erect penises placed quite heroically in cities around Greece. At these memorials, people would hold solemn processions as they sing the so-called phallic hymn, and we're told that it's because of Dionysus that they're doing this isn't a shameful act at all, but a righteous one. And for a quick final bonus story, Tiresias. You remember him. He's the blind prophet of so many stories from Greek mythology. He has a hand in Oedipus and Odysseus and others, but those are the ones that are coming to me in this moment. But there was a time that Tiresias experienced a change, though a temporary one. According to Apollodorus, Tiresias once witnessed a couple of snakes fucking. Yes, snakes fucking. And when he saw those snakes fucking, he injured one of the snakes. And in return, he was changed into a woman. Later, she saw two more snakes fucking. Yes, more snakes fucking. And then was changed back into a woman. There isn't much more to the story than this, except that once, Zeus and Hera were fighting over who enjoys sex more. Men or women. There's only one person they could ask to settle the argument. Only one person had experienced both. Tiresias. So Zeus and Hera called on Tiresias to ask who experiences more pleasure during sex. And Tiresias told them, on a scale from 1 to 10, men experience 1, and women experience the remaining 9. Hera, though, for some reason doesn't like this answer, even though I'm all for it. She blinds Tiresias, and Zeus, feeling bad for him, gifts him with the ability to see the future, to be a prophet. And he lives for ages, hence all the aforementioned stories. Oh, thank you all for listening to this, our final episode for Pride Month, even though it isn't airing during Pride Month. If you know any other stories of LGBTQ characters in mythology, whether Greek or other, please send them to me, as I'd love to start compiling a list to tell next June. Sadly, there are other names that are certainly associated, but they have only vague references to such stories, no stories to tell, even as minor as some of the ones I've told here. But hopefully, with all of you providing me with your suggestions, there will be enough for next June to be devoted to these characters as well. And I'm happy to go beyond Greek if I need to. I also want to thank you all again for donating the books. It's been utterly touching. I keep having to update the list, and when I update the list, then you all buy them all again. And it's just amazing. 
I'm moving this month, so everything is in boxes. My bookshelves are all bare and sad, but now I'm even more excited to set everything up in my new apartment. I'll have a tiny little podcast corner, I'm calling it, where I'll be able to have all my classics books and all my podcast things all together, and it's going to be wonderful. I'm definitely going to be showing you all because you've contributed so many books to this collection, and I should be able to find myths to come for God knows how long. You're not getting rid of me yet. You're all the best. I'm Liv, and I love this shit.